Happy holidays, everybody. This may be the final video before Christmas. You never know, I might sneak in one more, but this is a biggie. This is uh, the celebration of something I've been working on for the last couple of days, but thinking about all year, because finally the list is published. The list that I talked about doing a couple of weeks ago, at least, is finally done. It usually comes out in early December, if not late November, and this time around, man, there's just been too much to do. You know, we're kind of finding our feet, recalling muscle memory as far as doing everything that we used to do here at the store, doing events and uh, doing wine bar and so on. So all of that has taken some extra energy, just kind of remembering how to do it. So this list kind of got forgotten, never forgotten actually, but it got just pushed aside, pushed aside, pushed aside. The list is done. I have written about, I believe, 39 different wines. Sometimes I aspire to 40. <laughs> and this is all I could do this time, 39. I'm sorry, not quite enough for you. But I've written a nice little paragraph about 39 different wines that we think are very special. Special is the word of the year on the list. It is in fact called the most surprising wines of 2021. The most surprising, every, every wine that's good should be a surprise, like, whoa, that's good. And it can have extra woes of surprise with uh, like a location you've never heard of or a grape you've never heard of. Um, things that are distinctively good they're still out there for me to try. There is still surprise left for me in my wine odyssey. Yes, even yours truly, who tastes 150 wines every week, simply can't get enough surprises. They just keep coming. So let's tell you about 39 surprises and you're thinking, oh my God, how long is this video gonna be? Well, this is the longest part, just the, uh, the, the beginning, just to let you know how we're gonna do this. I'm gonna put a bottle at a time in front of you and then run off. Some of these are almost a quarter mile away. <laughs> it's a long line of wines. I'm gonna have to run off, replace that bottle, get the next one. So, rapid fire, all right? But I wanna tell you about these really nice wines, why they are surprising. And I'm gonna start with one that's in the glass. This is a Cremant de Bourgogne, which means it is sparkling wine from, not Champagne, but from Burgundy, just a little south of Champagne. This is the best Cremant de Bourgogne we have carried in years. It is made of Chardonnay. It is vintage 2017. It's brilliant. The texture is fluffy. The, the bubbles are beautiful. That's good. Like bread dough and um, pears, I believe. Mm, nummy. Okay, that's it for that, right? We're on a roll. Let's do a bunch of bright whites real fast. How about this one from Spain? <laughs> it's not from Spain. This is north of Spain, sorry. This is from Muscadet. Muscadet is not the name of the grape. Don't worry, it ain't Muscat. It's Muscadet is the wine region on the Atlantic where they make the best oyster wine in the world. This is one of them. Beautiful label, right? A beautiful gift to give, but also drink it if you love, love raw oysters or shrimp or any seafood at all with this Muscadet. Bright white from the briny Atlantic coast. All right. Onward. Let's go a little south of there. Just a little south of there and a little south of Bordeaux is an area called Gascony or Gascon. And this is the very first 100% Gromansang we've ever carried. Gromansang is usually part of the blends from Gascony. And in this case, it is isolated. You get to try Gromansang. It is deliciously silly, careless, fun, zingy, vibrant, dry, and yet beautifully fruited wine. You got to try it. 100% Gromansang. Next up is Something you've all heard of before, but it's the best example thereof that we have tasted in perhaps a couple of years. This is the best Sancerre I have put in front of you in a while. Sancerre, yeah, you've heard of it. You've drunk it in Paris, you've had it in Pleasanton. Sancerre gets around. This is Sancerre, the region in the Loire Valley of France, 100% Sauvignon Blanc, and this one is not overly flinty or green. It has a little more passion fruit, a little more tropicality, I'd say, a little more melon on the uh, fleshiness on the pellet, delicious. This is a very feel-good Sancerre for just a little bit under $30. Still a pretty damn good value for a wine that's getting more and more pricey out there. All right. Hey, you know, this could be faster if we tell you about two wines at one time. These are both called Godeo. Godeo is the name of the grape, as grown in Bierto, Spain, and Emilio Moro, who makes wine over in Rivera del Duero, Greek Tempranillo there. They also go over to Bierto for this project. So these are two different Godeos from Emilio Moro. And this one is no oak. This is called Povorete. It's kind of the entry level. It's delicious, it's clean, and yet it's got fleshiness to it. It's got a nice mouthfeel. This one treated like white burgundy, and the price is like white burgundy, but you know, come at it with a, a little bit of uh, worship in mind and put it in a big uh, Pinot Noir glass. Intend to smell it, don't over chill it. Have it cool, but not freezing cold. Have it with scallops, seared scallops, maybe some cream sauce. 
nummy num. This is beautiful stuff. This is elegant bump up Godeo. Both from Emilio Moro. While we are on the subject of Spain, why don't we show you a white wine that just arrived yesterday. I tasted it last week and I said, it's a surprise. It's a surprise because it is white, Rioja. Wow, we've carried that before, but usually those are mundane, kind of not exciting white wines. This is exciting for the novelty because instead of being made of Yura, as most white Riojas are, this is made of 100% Tempranillo Blanco. Yes, a mutation of the Red Gate grape, um, Tempranillo occurred in one Rioja vineyard on one Rioja vineyard's grapevine. One vine was noticed by the farmer as all of a sudden growing white grapes, and it was therefore renamed Tempranillo Blanco. This is 100% Tempranillo Blanco. It's not expensive. It's not the most amazing wine you'll ever have, but it's very good for its low price, and it's distinctive. It's a surprise. Tempranillo Blanco from Don Jacobo. Don't worry, this is all in writing too, if you care to read all that gibberish. Now, for some reason, we did a lot of Syrahs this year. I don't know why, I didn't plan to, but every year the list has a different emphasis. There's no real plan. I'm not gonna do like three Pinots and three Cabs. And th you know, it's not that organized. It is whatever is surprising me right now. Not even four months ago, but now. So why don't we tell you about five different Syrahs? This is from the homeland of Syrah, the Northern Rhone. And this is by Sylvain Badel. If the label looks a little bit familiar, you'll realize that as a wine adventure club member, you got the former vintage of this. It's the wine that was stinky for the first couple minutes of swirling, and then all of a sudden, whew, here came the Northern Rhone. Beautiful value too, it's inexpensive. This is the new vintage. It ain't stinky, it's just reluctant when you smell it at first, and then it blooms. It's beautiful Northern Rhone Syrah for a not Northern Rhone Syrah price. Now, here comes a wine that is more appropriately priced to the Northern Rhone. I'm not answering the phone. But it's gorgeous. This is Cobro Tea. Cobro Tea is worshipped. Cobro Tea is always expensive. And sometimes it's a little freaky to people who don't love Northern Rhone Syrah. This is more beautiful. This has nice fruit. Todd and I were drinking a bottle the other day and remarking on how it has a little more mouthfeel to it and a little more uh, like endearing fruit. This is gorgeous Cobro Tea. So it's kind of a bridge style Cobro Tea, okay? Let's have a Syrah from where? From Sicily? Are you kidding? This wine has convinced me that Sicily may think about pulling out all of their Nero Diavola and planting Syrah. This is really elegant, eloquent and elegant, black colored, lithe and yet mouth filling Syrah from Sicily, Sicily, Italy. Why not? How about a Syrah that won't freak anybody out because Syrah is sometimes abandoned by the consumer because they don't know what kind of Syrah they're gonna get. Is it gonna be stinky or is it gonna be over the top? This is in between. This is a nice uh, fence straddler, you could say. Ex Umbris from, of course, Washington State. It is a delicious, easygoing Syrah you can hand to anybody, pour for anybody at your holiday table. And it's also pricing nicely in the mid 20s. It's very good Ex Umbris by Owen Rowe Syrah. Finally, let's stay in Washington and tell you that we do have some of this in the collectible room. The collectible room has Cayuse at long last. I mean, sometimes I get three bottles of Cayuse and I tell somebody it never even gets onto the floor. That somebody just says, I'll take it. It's expensive. This is from a producer in Washington state um, who makes beautiful Syrah and other varieties, but Syrah is kind of his house variety. And Cayuse is a fantastic, very soft bore wine. If you've never heard of it, it's because very little is made and those who know it, grab it all. So I'm just saying we got lucky this year with a nice allocation of Cayuse. Come in and ask. <laughs> and uh, let's see if we can help you. Onward. Why not a Zinfandel? How about a surprise? Huh? We never put Zinfandel out in front of you. We just kind of like, maybe we OD'd on it a long time ago and just don't, maybe you don't give it the time of day enough. But Hartford, does, uh, does, it definitely deserves the time of day. This is Hartford from the Russian River Valley and they do an amazing job with Zin. Beautiful, exuberant fruit, but not overly jammy. It is, it is fruit forward done right with that extra amount of bramble and baking spice. It is gorgeous Zin, and I wanna thank Peter out there for urging me to bring it back into the store. I tasted it again with a rep and I said, I gotta get over the fact that I OD'd on Zin a long time ago. I gotta get this in. It's nice, nice, beautiful, surprising Zinfandel. Let's do two Pinot Noirs. Let's put them in front of you at one time because they couldn't be more different from each other. Here, Tatamer, made down in the Los Alamos area of Santa Barbara County, is delicate in color, profound in nose, and long in flavor, even though it's not big and like jammy. It is, you know, just like, it's one of those more intellectual pinotists, if you will, and only 48 cases were made, remarkably small amount of wine. Now, you probably recognize this label. This is a Pinot Noir specialist 
up in the San Lucia Highlands, actually ironically right across the street from the Appalachian boundary line. So they're in Monterey, not San Lucia Highlands, but their Pinots are just as good as anybody across the street. This is our favorite wrath. We tasted all the different wraths and said, this is the one we're gonna go for. So there's two beautiful Pinots to consider. Small production on both. And now let's go to a uh, category that I would just call like misfit toys or <laughs> uh, blends that like, what the hell are they? And we'll start with a wine that is only $14.99 a bottle. And that's before your wine club discount because we want this list to represent a nice spread of not just types, but also price points. So why don't we tell you after a little sip of this, Good, intermission. Okay, we're back. Portalupi, and uh, this particular wine from Portalupi, they're up in Healdsburg, but this is from California. It's a blend of Barbera, Tempranillo, Syrah, and one other thing I'm not remembering right now, maybe Malbec. Um, what is surprising about this is so many of the wines, pricing at like 15 bucks and less, they taste fake. They taste like they've been like run through the everlasting gobstopper machine in Willy Wonka's factory to become some kind of facsimile of wine, not really the real thing. This is the real thing. It tastes real. It's balanced, it's flavorful, and yet it's not stupid, okay? So drink it. All right, how about another blend? This is made with Vranich and uh, some other shit that I've never heard of, and it is remarkably good. The thing is, it's from Northern Macedonian, Macedonia, and it is really catching on around here. We gave it to the World Class Wine Club a couple of months ago, and it keeps selling. I think because even though people can't pronounce the names, they are uh, appreciating the darkness, the firmness, and uh, the resemblance perhaps to Montepulciano and or Alianico from Italy. It's got big chunky stuff going on. It's made by a big guy also. The, have you ever seen a picture of Philippe Cambi? He's a famous winemaker in Chateau de Pop. He goes to Northern Macedonia to make this. This is big winter wine, feasting wine. How about that? Now, here's something familiar. Well, actually not familiar looking, but it will be familiar once I tell you that this is Stoltman's uh, La Quadria. We sell it every year and yet the label is different every year and that's why like the marketing people hate this idea. You know, why change the look? Stick with something that people will recognize the next time around. But this is to keep a particular graphic artist employed, I suppose. And uh, there's probably a tattoo you can get of the same guy. Anyway, this is gorgeous. Syrah, Sangiovese, and Grenache. Three of the grapes that do so well in Ballard Canyon of Santa Barbara County. And that's those are the grapes that Stoltman champions. Stoltman had a lot to do with Ballard Canyon becoming a sub AVA of uh, Santa Barbara County. And Stoltman Quadria, friendly, friendly price, friendly for everybody at the table. It's easygoing, delicious, dark juice. Okay. Now let's go to Spain and tell you that we just received our last three six packs of Clio. Clio is soft for it, comes out this time of the year, and then it's gone by Christmas time. We sell out of our allocation very quickly. It gets ridiculous ratings every year. It is made of Monastrel, that's also known as Mavedra, and has a little dab of Cabernet in there as well. And Clio, this is just to say, come and get it or forget about it because it won't be here uh, much, much later than the publication of this video. So Clio is here and gone. Right on. Hey, let's talk about two white wines because we haven't talked about white wine in about 10 minutes. <laughs> and let's talk about two domestic ones. I recently went to Walla Walla, Washington State knowing that we weren't gonna make it over to Europe this year, so had to find a vacation somewhere. So, learned a lot in three days of tasting in Walla Walla. And this is a Sauvignon Blanc from a project you've already heard from us about called Long Shadows. We've historically carried Long Shadows, Reds, a great Merlot, a great Cabernet, and so on. And yet, when I had this Sauvignon Blanc, I said, hey, I've never seen this before. And they said, well, it doesn't go to the California market. And I said, can we change that? And after a couple of months of wrangling and begging and pleading, we finally have Symbol, which is one of the best Sauvignon Blancs I've ever tasted. Now, it's kind of ironic that people will buy up for great Chardonnay. They'll pay $50, $100, or even more for fantastic Chardonnay. And yet they won't buy up for Sauvignon Blanc. Let's change that. This is elegant. It's made in concrete egg and stainless steel drums and French oak barrels, most of which were neutral. And it has mouthfeel that is beautiful. It has smells of, uh, of um, stone fruit and a little bit of citrus as well, but uh, the stone fruit thing really works. In other words, it's Sauvignon Blanc that has a little more oomph to it. It's lovely. Now, here's Chardonnay. You can buy up for this, right? <laughs> this is beautiful $60 Chardonnay before your wine club discount made by Sojourn. So what's the surprise? The surprise is that we haven't seen Sojourn for years and all of a sudden it has re-emerged. A new vendor has it, brought it to us. We, we have Sojourn. Uh, Cabernet and Pinot and this gorgeous Chardonnay from Durrell Vineyard, Sonoma Coast. Beautiful mouthfeel. It is big, done right. Very voluptuous, lovely stuff. All right. 
Onward, quickly. Oh, let's go to France for three wines. France. And this is from the Beaujolais region, the subregion of uh, Beaujolais. Uh, all those subregions are called crews. There are 10 crews or neighborhoods of Beaujolais. And this is from the one of the smallest crews and the northernmost crew. You're almost in Macon here. You're almost in southern Burgundy. And this is the area called Saint Amour. Best Saint Amour I've ever had. Really beautiful nose. Um, a, a young lady came in the other day and said, I'm having salmon and roast chicken for Christmas Eve. What should I have with it? And I said, you only need one wine. It will be this. And we started with 12 bottles. I've already drunk one and she's had one. So we're at 10. Okay. Run it out. Run it out. Now, the other day we had a fun event with Charles Neal and we were gonna pour this Bordeaux and decide that this Bordeaux should go at the very end because it's Bordeaux, right? Bordeaux, massive and important. And I had it the day before tasting the sequence and I realized, gosh, after the Northern Rhone Syrah that is second of the last, this sucks. It just doesn't have any joy. It, it didn't suck, but it's just like, it was grim, all right? Bordeaux is meant to be kind of grim, but after the fruit of the Syrah, no, it didn't work. So I changed the sequence. I put it before the Rhones, and all of a sudden, this was the Bordeaux it should be. It made me hungry for a winter feast. This is beautiful Saint Emilion, right bank, a combination of Merlot and Cabernet Franc. Now let's take you somewhere where you don't usually go, except if you come into the wine store, you're getting used to visiting locations that are new to you, right? This is called Fougere. Fougere is in the southwest part of France, and it is a it's a beautiful combination of Syrah and there's that word again, Grenache, and I believe Senso in this case. And it's inexpensive, it's thoughtful, it is correct to location, it is balanced, it's a beautiful food wine that you've never heard of before. So come and get it. Meteor, it's actually grown in the footprint of an ancient uh, meteor landing. So like, there's a big crater down there and now it's inhabited by a vineyard. Pretty cool. All right, how about cab? Let's do some cab, right? Let's go first to, no, let's not, because this is, in our way, look at this. This is all we have left uh, to say that we have a fantastic Merlot down there and yet all we have left is the advertisement for it. Um, and yet, this that's the cool thing, right? We sold out of a Merlot. We had a couple of cases and boom, they went. As soon as we poured it on the wine bar, people said, whoa, I think I like Merlot. So a whole generation after the movie Sideways really, really beat up on that grape with one brief comment. Merlot is back, this is Rutherford Hill. Merlot, and it will be back in tomorrow, and it's gorgeous. It's everything Merlot's supposed to be, easygoing and plump and, you know, softer than Cabernet, right? So come and get Rutherford Hill Merlot, and we have it back in tomorrow. Real briefly, another entry from Washington State. As you can tell, we're kind of high on that, that uh, wine growing region. This is the second label for Chris Upchurch's Upchurch Cab. It's grown on Red Mountain. Red Mountain is perhaps the most significant wine region of um, Washington State, even though it's very, very little, and Chris Upchurch, who has been making the wine for years at DeLille, now has his own project called Upchurch LTL, or Larger Than Life, is beautiful 100% Cabernet that tastes like 50% $50 Napa Cab, frankly, and yet it's in the very low 30s. Under that, with your wine club discount. This is a surprise here, Ehlers Estate. It's a surprise in that we just never cared to carry Ehlers. Ehlers would show us their wine, and we'd say, how much is it? And we'd say, well, quality and price don't match up. Now it does. They have a new winemaker, Laura Munoz, uh, La Laura Diaz Munoz, uh, formerly of Gallery and La Coya and um, other fancy places like Carnal. She's done all that. And now she's the winemaker here and you can taste the difference. This is significant Cabernet that does deserve to be on our shelf and on uh, in your cellar. All right, get into Ehlers Estate. We now endorse it. Next up, this is a surprise because we never thought we would like a, uh, a Cabernet that has the Japanese name for dragonfly on it, Akatombo, all right? Well, the other surprise is this is made by a winemaker who's garnered 100 point ratings for his wines and yet we don't know who he is. So uh, his other wine with his name on it would cost twice as much and yet this is barely over 100 bucks. This is true Howl Mountain stuff, big and like ominous in a delicious way. It's really good, Akatombo. Howl Mountain Cabernet Sauvignon. All right, let's tell you about one more Cabernet, which is perhaps my favorite of the year because you can hold on to it or drink it now. And it is a beautiful, faithful representative of representation of Rutherford. This is called Ibu. It's the higher end uh, label of Tilth. And Ibu, which means owl, is 100% Cabernet from Rutherford, 
and uh, it's a single vineyard, Star Vineyard, and the, it's cool, th it's delicious, but what's also amazing is only 100 cases were made and the wine steward's in on the ground floor of this delicious project. Perhaps one of the best Cabernets I've drunk this year, and you can drink it this year, or you can save it. This is special stuff, 100 cases made, ground floor. We're cool. <laughs> now, how about just an endorsement for something sweet real quick. Look at the beautiful box, let's see if we can get it open, and you're witnessing a bottle that was in barrel for nearly 50 years. This is 1970 Tawny Port from Taylor Fladgate. It's called Very Old. They couldn't think of a better name. And yet, um, whereas most Tawny Port oxidizes for about three or four years in a barrel, this stayed in cask for almost all 50 of its years. 1970, got anybody born in 1970? Or you just want some really beautiful high-end port? This is great stuff. Let's go to Italy real quick. How are we doing on time? I don't dare check. That would just waste time. Cesanese. This is a Cesanese grape from the area that uh, Rome inhabits. So this is from the area of Lazio. And red checkered tablecloth wine. That's what Cesanese usually is. This one has a little more stuffing and a little more complexity. And so that workhorse wine by the glass list wine of Rome aspires here. It gets better. Cesanese. Never heard of it. You ought to try it. Pasta Bolognese. Here it comes. Now, of course, you've heard of Brunello di Montalcino. Well, this is from the famous 2016 vintage. We loved the 2015 version of this. We absolutely love the 2016. It's the best Brunello and Tuscan vintage in many, many years. 15 was great. 16 is possibly even better. It's definitely more ageable. It's darker. La Racina, we just made a commitment to it. So please come in and help me with my inventory issue. It is beautiful 2016 Brunello di Montalcino, which has to be what? 100%? What? What? Anybody? Sangiovese. It's perhaps the most important Sangiovese in the world that, uh, from that area of Montalcino. Great stuff. Let's stay in Italy. One more bottle here. And this is Il Fano, a wine we've carried and clubbed many, many times. This may be my favorite El, uh, Il Fano ever. Il Fano di Arcanum is made, even though it's made in Tuscany, the land of Sangiovese, it's made entirely with Bordeaux varieties. So we call it a super Tuscan. And yet it's got the soul of Tuscany in it. There's something about the feel and the flavor. And yet it's also got some essence of Bordeaux too. It's gorgeous stuff. Il Fano, I think in one way, it's the best wine in the store based on price, based on durability, based on complexity. All those things line up here at a really good, I already said it, price. Very good. Ilfano, nice. Best vintage ever, perhaps. Let's go to something special. Pricey, yes, but it's special. It's from a crew. It's not just the village wine of Barolo, but it is a crew, Canubi crew from Enodi. And um, really, if you're gonna have a feast and perhaps like the braised meat kind of thing, short ribs or asabuco, this is the beautiful thing to have with it. Decant this while you make that long slow cooked meal, right? And uh, gosh, maybe I will. Canubi crew, it's, this is not just the regular stuff. You gotta buy up for a, a beautiful Canubi, but come on, it's a special time of the year, right? All right, I have a couple of bubblies to tell you about. Let's put two sparkling wines in front of you. And I've already blown it. This is not sparkling wine. You know, in Basque country of Spain, up in the far northern part of Spain, they have been making sidra or cider for hundreds of years, not just like last week, ever since, you know, cider all of a sudden got hot around here. No, it's been hot. It's been exciting and sought for in this part of Spain for a very, very long time. So this is Basque cider. What's cool about it is it made like champagne, method traditional. In other words, the second fermentation occurs in individual bottles. That's the hard way to make great bubbly, but you can feel it, you can taste it. It's got gorgeous length to it. I had a bottle at 9 a.m. yesterday because I've gotten here early for the last couple of days and I really needed a cider break and this fit, filled the bill. It's not inexpensive, but it is beautiful and it's like a labor of love. We also have two other ciders from these guys, a Stadabay that costs a little bit less. Now here's a champagne, biodynamically grown, of which we only have two cases, and then it's gone for a very long time because it's changing vendors and we don't know where it's going. But L'Armandie Bernier, once again, biodynamic farming is rare in champagne. A lot of farmers feel like they don't really have to go to that uh, labor intensive and inconvenient length because champagne's already famous. They've already got it made, but these guys care enough. There's only about 24 producers of biodynamically grown champagne. Did you know that? As big as that region is, L'Armandier is one of our longtime favorites. Get into it. Biodynamic, yeah, it's cool. It makes, it, it restores the earth, but it also makes a better wine. This has, uh, <laughs> this has complexity that will amaze you. It's special. I have three more wines to tell you about. I'm not gonna go on forever. 
Let's finish with one of our favorite subjects and tell you about Chateauneuf de Pop. 2019 Chateauneuf de Pop in general. They're dark, they're delicious. This is made by Bois La Zone. And I'm putting this in front of you as one of the surprises of the year because the 19 vintage surprises with color and intensity. This is lovely wine, as are all the other 19s down there. Seek them out, all right? This is Domaine Chosy by Bois La Zone. The next one is kind of hard to pick up because it's really big. We had a dozen of these, we have two left. Doesn't even all fit on the frame, right? But this is a double magnum, that is four bottles worth of a glorious 2016 Chateauneuf de Pop. 16 was the last vintage before 19 that was big and dark and ageable. And this is from Domaine de la Charbonnière. This is their Vie Vigne version, which means the older vines, it's the good stuff. And uh, once again, four bottles, it got 98,000 points from somebody and somebody else as well. And <laughs> anyway, it's pretty cool to have four bottles of Chateauneuf. Wine ages better in volume, as you know. So <clears throat> grab one of the last two of these. How about that? What a party, huh? Doesn't that look like fun? Or a great gift, of course. And then drum roll, please. We're not necessarily saying this is the number one wine, but it is one of our number one wines every year. It's always a surprise. Every time you drink a great bottle of Clou de Pop, you were surprised that once again, they've done it. This is a 2019, yes, the great vintage of one of the greatest Chateauneuf de Pops made. There must be over 200 producers of that wine type because it's a pretty big wine region, bigger than Livermore. And yet there are about four or five that I would call the greatest easily on this one hand of fingers. This one occurs, Clou de Pop 2019 is here. Our 2 case allocation will not last long. Get in on it, it's beautiful stuff. And with that, we thank you for listening and watching. And this will come into your email box any minute now. I'm gonna get it out and you'll be able to read or watch or both. You can follow along in here, but I didn't really do the sequence, so whatever. Come on in, bring the list in with you, print it out, bring it in, and uh, we'll help you find these, all right? Thank you very much. Merry Christmas, happy holidays, and we will see you soon.